So our next speaker, Bambi Francisco Rosen, is a Filipino-American entrepreneur, investor, and journalist. She is founder and CEO of Vator, an awesome community of high-tech entrepreneurs and investors at the intersection of media and finance. Ms. Francisco is an, also a managing partner at Vatour Investment Club, which is an equivalent to a $50 million early stage investment firm. So they invest in early stage technology companies so that she has a lot of interesting things to share with you about what they are doing. Prior to Vatour, Ms. Francisco was an award-winning journalist as a syndicated columnist and a TV correspondent for my favorite Dow Jones Market Watch. Please help me give a warm welcome to Bambi. Clicker? Is this it? No? That's not. This is the clicker. Here, okay. Well, hi, everyone, and good afternoon. Kim, thank you for inviting me. Actually, I used to speak on the Money Show 10 years ago, so it's nice to be back. I want to ask everyone here, how many of you have invested in a venture capital firm, in a fund? Okay, so three or four of you. How many of you have done some angel investing? Okay, small. So the Money Show really attracts a lot of investors that invest in public stocks and commodities and other things that are more accessible. What I'm going to talk to you about are startups. That's the world I've been living in over the last 15 years. So I want to start by giving you a sense of Vader because you're probably wondering, why am I listening to this woman on stage? So if you think about what an investor needs to do to be able to make the right investments, they need to have deal flow, right? They need to see a selection of startups, a selection of companies. For public investors, you get the public market exchanges, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones. Um, you know what companies are available. It's really hard to do that in the startup stage. So as an investor, you need to create your own deal flow flywheel. You also need access, because unlike in the public markets, where you can call your broker and say, give me 10 shares of Google, you can't do that in the private sector. You need to know the entrepreneurs. You need to be able to say, hey, can I get in on your round? And oftentimes, you can't. Um, you need an investment vehicle. And you need knowledge. You need to understand what's, where the puck is heading. And so that information, you can get a lot of information about publicly traded stocks. And increasingly, you can get a lot of that information about the private sector and where innovation is heading. But you need that knowledge. And that's what Vader is about. We are an ecosystem. As I mentioned, we have access. So over the last 10 years, we've created an enormous network of VCs and CEOs. Some of these names are probably familiar to you. Peter Thiel, who is actually the largest investor in my company, Vader. Elon Musk, Brian Chesky of Airbnb, Mark Cuban, Jack Dorsey, who started Twitter. All of these men and women are people that who I role, are role models, meaning we look at the characteristics of these entrepreneurs and we try to find them in the startups we invest in, in the entrepreneurs we invest in, meaning they have to be curious, they have to be unconventional, unconventional, and they have to be relentless. And these people are also a source of deal flow for us and a source of knowledge. And they like us, again, because we also provide them quality deal flow. And entrepreneurs also like us. And why do they need to like us? Well, as I mentioned, you can't just unlike the public sector, you can't just invest in any company. You actually have to know these people. You actually need to be able to say, hey, can I put $100,000, can I put $500,000 into your company? And then they have to, then they go back, they get back to you and say, well, why? What can you do for me? So what can we do for entrepreneurs? Well, we give them, we put them in the conversation. So there's somebody we put in front of Mark Cuban. We put a number of companies on stage. Um, we've helped them over the last 10 years raise a billion dollars in capital. So we created, my background is a journalist, but we created Vader, which is short for innovator. We created that to be at the intersection of media and finance. So if you want to, we have a fund 
uh, but we also allow accredited investors to invest alongside us. So you can go to vader.tv forward slash Vic, and that's short for Vader Investment Club, and you can invest $10,000 in some of these companies that we identify. So who am I? So that was a little bit about Vader, but who am I? And again, why are you listening to me? I am the founder and CEO of Vader. Prior to that, I was a journalist. I was a columnist and correspondent for Market Watch, um, where I went on C CNBC and Fox and talked about publicly traded stocks as well as private stocks, mostly in technology. Um, I was an anchor for CBS, and I was on Wall Street at one point. Uh, random facts, I'm a mother of four boys, ages six to 17. So in my free time, I do Vader and other things um, in the past. I like adventure, that's why I had four boys, although I wanted a girl. But um, I did trek to Everest Base Camp. I rode the Tour de France, the Pyrenees, hilly section. I ran the Camino de Santiago, which you typically walk, but I didn't have any patience for that. And I rode the death ride, and one time in my life, I actually did work for Donald Trump. Many years ago, before he was president. So. What, so 10 years ago, we came to, I came together with uh, my co-founder, and we started Vader, this platform. It was actually the first marketplace connecting entrepreneurs, startups, with investors. This was 10 years ago. Um, and you should have heard all the people saying to me, that is such a niche market. There's not that many entrepreneurs. Now it's a global meme. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Um, and then in the last 10 years, I kept advising people to invest pre-IPO because this was where the value was being created. And I would say that, especially over the last five years, I would say that the private markets are where the public markets were back in 1980. So back in 1980, there were about 400 to 500 mutual funds. Uh, we were at the start of a bull market and more people were coming in to the markets creating these mutual funds. By the end of the decade, by the end of that bull market, we had about 5,000 mutual funds. The same thing's happening in the private sector. We're seeing massive, massive amounts of money going into venture funds. Now we're a venture fund, we're one of them. So what you're seeing a number of these created because we want to be able to realize that value. And this is what's happening. This is why it's happening. Because it's taking 11 years to go public. I think George Gilder said earlier that entrepreneurship is on the decline. It's not on the decline. It's just it's not being accessed by public traders, public market investors. So if you think about Amazon, it went public in 97 at half a billion dollars. Microsoft, $750 million. But Google. By the time you could actually invest in Google, it was already $25 billion. By the time you could invest in Facebook, it was $100 billion. By the time you can invest in Uber and Airbnb, they're going to be $100 billion. It's the value creation is lost on anyone who wants to get in after the IPO. So how do we get, how do we, how do, how does, how do I, and how does my company actually get all of these Quality looks at startups. We actually have a platform that uh, is used by a number of organizations, including hospitals like UCSF and um, hardware companies like Samsung. And they use it because they're trying to find new startups and new ideas. And then they also evaluate it. So our startup enables them to uh, distribute that profile of a startup and actually aggregate all the feedback. So we can actually see some of the feedback from what these experts are saying about these startups, and that creates a great filter for us. Um, some of how we did, so of course I've selected some really good companies. We've, we've actually worked with 200 and invested in some, but Thumbtack is a company. How many people have heard of Thumbtack? Okay, so we knew Thumbtack 10 years ago it was valued at $5 million. Um, and today it's almost a billion dollars. So it takes a while to create this value, but um, you know, if you're willing, and it's, it's also extremely risky, but this is, these are one of the companies that, uh, or four of them that we saw create $2 billion in value creation. Now that said, it has to be realized, right? Because we're still in the private markets. So once they go public, let's see how much they're really, uh, how much value they've really created. 
Um, so what are we looking for? So a couple of you said that you're actually an angel investing. The gentleman who spoke before me said, look, you got to go in there and actually start investing in these companies. So when entrepreneurs approach you and say, hey, can you write me a $10,000 check or $50,000 check, what do you look for? Well, you have to look for a company that's fulfilling future demand. And that future means something that's more cost efficient and something that's more convenient. That's what you have to look for. You also have to look for whether what they're showing you gives you a 10x better experience. So I'll give you an example of Uber. That was obvious. As soon as you saw that app five years ago, uh, it was pretty obvious that that was a better experience than hailing a cab. So when you look at a service, is it that much better? Economic value proposition with Thumbtack. 10 years ago, I went on the app and I was looking for a piano teacher. So Thumbtack connects you with different services and uh, local services. And so when I went on Thumbtack, I was looking for a piano teacher and I said, here's my budget. This is when I need them. I was able to get three responses. Now I compared that with the alternative, which was going online, finding the piano teachers, calling them, and I thought, this is so much better. Um, it was even better than Yelp. You know why? Because I could actually transact. So when you think about these things, think about the alternatives, and is it that much 10x better? Um, it has to have a unique target focus. A lot of entrepreneurs, when you sit down with them, they want to you know, boil the ocean. Can't do that. You can't do that. First of all, you don't have enough money. So you do think they have to figure out some small slice and command that and, and perfect that our target market um, and their product at the same time. And you need a, an entrepreneur that's determined and resourceful. So this is a long haul. This is a long haul with peaks and valleys. And so you want somebody who is really, really in it for the long term. Um, some other key patterns and tailwinds. I like to look for price information transparency. We live in a data-rich world. I think Kim mentioned we're in the information economy, knowledge economy. So everybody wants to be armed with data. I mean, all of you right now are armed with data, and you want to make your decisions. Imagine the millennials. They really want to make their own decisions. Um, and they want price transparency. So look for that in some of the, the startups that you're seeing. Um, we live in a, in a culture where everything is on demand. I'm really worried about my six-year-old. I don't even know what that world is going to look like, but he thinks everything is on demand. And um, it's also consumer-directed. So are the services that you're looking at for these startups that are creating these new products and services, are they consumer-directed? Um, is there cultural and technological readiness? This is really important, cultural readiness. You don't want to be that much ahead of the market because it's really expensive to teach the market um, what you're doing. And that adoption, four or five year adoption curve could kill a company. So, um, and you have to be inefficient, has to be an inefficient, large and opaque market. So I looked at uh, the media and commerce for a long time. So mid 90s to 2005, you saw Amazon go public, you saw Google go public, you saw Facebook go, go public. And now they have totally transformed what we consider commerce companies and um, media companies. My one son, we told, we were talking about Amazon, the river, and he's like, Amazon's not a river. It's, it's where you buy stuff. And I mean, it's just, it, you know, they have no concept of, of you know, JC Penney or something, right? Um, it's, so now we're looking at healthcare. Those are opaque. Think about the healthcare companies today. They're old. They're old. They've been around for a long time. And that industry needs to change. It's very opaque. And guess what? There's a bunch of millennials who are 35 right now in mid-management positions. And they're saying, I can't. Wait a second. I don't know how to like really file files, files of paper. You know, that's not how I do stuff in the, you know, in the consumer world. And so they are changing things. And that's an exciting opportunity. And also opportunities for self-employment, because we do live, particularly with millennials, they like the flexible schedule. So um, more of them. So if you look at companies that are creating opportunities where other people can have a side hustle, like Uber or Airbnb, that's also something that you should look at. 
Okay, as I said, healthcare and real estate, those are my areas that I, I think I, there's big opportunities for disruption. And it's also coincidentally where people are spending the most money. This is a 2018 report that shows that in terms of our disposable income, we're putting more money into real estate, our homes, and we're putting more money into our healthcare. So let's dive into healthcare and digital health a little bit. Um, these are the big trends in healthcare. Healthcare costs 18% of GDP. Compare that to Switzerland, which is 12% of GDP, or Singapore, which is 4% of GDP. Yet we have the worst outcomes. We have the highest death rates, and oh, by the way, on a percentage basis, we have mo more people with chronic conditions. 30% of people, Americans, have chronic conditions compared to 15% in Britain, 20% in Canada. Um, it's awful, yet we spend the most. So what is happening? So if you read the newspaper this year, it's amazing. Clinics are changing and the big companies are reacting. So Aetna and CVS announced this year that they want to partner. Walgreens and United Healthcare. United Healthcare wants to put urgent cl care clinics next to Walgreens. And Humana wants to build clinics inside Walmart. So they know they need to change. They know they need to get closer to the consumer. Aetna wants to be in CVS because CVS, 70% of people live by a CVS, within three miles of a CVS. Those are the new distribution channels. And Amazon, Berkshire, and JP Morgan, if uh, you may remember, they also announced a partnership. That's gonna be interesting because they're really going to change the way care is offered at corporations. Um, they're, they're definitely going to look at how we're going to bring more on-site clinics to corporations. So today, about 50% of corporations have an on-site clinic, and to, uh, that was up from 30% in 2014. Precision health and precision medicine is also an area of interest to us, and that's because of the massive amounts of DNA and genetic information we have in the electronic health records lots of rich da data in the EHR, but the DNA and the genetics. So that's interesting because about 2000, circa 2000, it cost $100 million to sequence a human genome. Today, it's about $100 or several hundred dollars. So using all of that data, there's hope that we're not going to be, as one speaker said earlier, carpet bombing people with treatments, but we're actually going to be tailoring them and personalizing them. Um, we're also looking at wellness. Millennials, so, well, there's somebody who talked about aging earlier. We don't want to age anymore. And we have technologies that can help us and, and, and um, make us more cognizant of how we should take, you know, what preventative steps we should take. Um, there's a huge opioid overdose um, crisis, leading death for those under 50. I hate to say that, 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 that is an opportunity there. Um, we need to create technologies to address this. And mental wellness. It's one out of five people are depressed, and that number is broadening, um, you know, largely because the definition of depression is also broadening. Um, but it is an area where you're seeing a number of startups emerge. It's the new, I call it, uh, it's the new weight loss market, which is rather large. And one of my favorites is the area of digital medications or digital therapeutics. They're actually going to try to replace medications, which is actually a good thing. So using software to do more, uh, um, using software to make you, um, or encourage you to do more, you know, Mad Libs or puzzles and to exercise your brain and to change your brain chemistry. All right, so quickly, the, I don't know how much time I have, but I'll, I'll run through some of the companies I think you should be aware of. So I talked about clinics. So there's new clinics called One Medical, Oscar Health, they've already raised about half a billion dollars. They've already been around for about five years. These are great companies. Um, they are re-envisioning what it looks like to go into uh, a clinic forward. Same thing, city block, mostly for underserved communities. Um, so when you think of clinics of tomorrow, think Apple Store, think spa, think swanky hotel. This is not about going to the DMV or having that type of DMV experience. It's about having a holistic, calming experience. That's the way tomorrow's clinics are going to look like. But oh, by the way, it's also about virtual clinics. So what's really interesting, like Doctor on Demand or Mercy Virtual or, or Maven, which just raised $30 million recently, 
So if you think about what's really funny, about almost 100 years ago, about 40% of your doctor's visits were at home. And in 1980, it was 1%. 1% of the doctor visits were at home. Well, now we're going back 100 years. And we have little robot companions that are there helping you to adhere to your medications, but also learning more about you, collecting the data about your condition. And so doctors and caregivers can remotely take care of you. And that's Alexa. Um, I haven't seen Amazon actually leverage that, but it's one of the reasons why I still really like Amazon. I don't know, at $2,000, but you know, I thought that at $1,200 when I bought Amazon again, and it's been OK. So the, for Amazon, the reason I bought it many, many years ago was because of AWS. Amazon Web Services. The reason I would like it today is it because of healthcare and its positioning and, and Alexa and what Alexa can do. And then, of course, we've got Doctor in Demand. We're, we're doing virtual uh, consultations. Um, another area, at-home DNA tests. As I mentioned, these genetic tests, have sequencing tests have dropped significantly. So you're seeing a number of these companies emerge, 23andMe, possibly the first one to go public. They've been around for um, 15 years. But an interesting company called Helix, and they raised about $200 million. I believe they've been around for three years now. What's interesting about them is if you think about the App Store, the App Store gives you a plethora of apps, whether it's your social network, you know, your maps, um, what other things, Zillow, or whatever, a, a number of apps. Helix is trying to be the app store for DNA tests. So you can go on Helix. They've got 35, but you know, they want 100 by the end of the year. So, uh, and, and a number of these other companies are also uh, uh, creating these at-home tests. Now, some of those tests are, you know, how much of a Neanderthal are you based on your genes? Um, you know, is your kid going to be a soccer superstar? Or are you really intelligent? Uh, intelligent, what was the other one? Um, strong or fast, I mean, stuff you probably would figure out already. Um, or are you predisposed to getting Alzheimer's or having high cholesterol? Now, all of these things, it's like a fad. I mean, they're bursting and people are throwing money into them. And I think at some point this information is going to be useful. But at this point, there's a lot of information and no actionable advice. Meaning, if you're going to tell me I have, I'm going to have Alzheimer's in 10, 15 years, then, and what should I do about it, or high cholesterol, and if you're going to tell me I should eat better, rest more, and be more active, then that's not useful information. I already know that. And so, there's all, so that's my critique on all these DNA tests, is we have all these information. We're not sure how accurate it is. We also don't have actionable solutions. That said, they're emerging, and they're going to be useful one day. But there are a lot of these companies creating them. Um, so this is another area that's booming. As I mentioned, mental health is significant. It's the second uh, cause of disability in the country behind heart disease. And there's all these companies that are emerging. Um, but they're all, again, like I said, they're sort of a, like a diet. There's, it's just a fad. There's so many of them. And uh, one of the reasons, and the ones in pink are the ones I actually like. And one of the reasons why I like supportive very young company, you wouldn't invest in it, and the pub, that's going to be another five years before it goes public. But the reason why I invested in that company is because it is actually doing something interesting. It's recreating the small groups like AA. These are the things that actually help people with addictions and with their mental state, not just these you know, medication apps. One of the reasons why I like Supportive is because it's actually creating these community groups and steroids. Um, so interesting space to watch. Paratherapeutics, as I mentioned as well, and Achille using digital therapeutics, meaning using software as a drug. So software to help your mind exercise your cognitive abilities. And paratherapeutics is probably, out of all of those, will probably be one of the ones who go, that goes public. Oh, so when I look at companies, I create a market map. This is my market map of mental health and wellness and behavior. So I look at, you know, what are they using? Are they using technologies or are they using therapists? Are they going for wellness or are they going for real hard clinical conditions with people with diabetes and chronic um, 
uh, uh, heart failure and, um, and Alzheimer's. So where are they? And one of the reasons why I like supportive was because it fell into an area that I actually didn't see many companies competing. So when, when I look at these companies, I try to create this mental market map to try to see where companies fit in. Okay, some other interesting areas. So with all of this new data and the ability to connect, care is actually screening and diagnostics and treatments actually is changing. Um, so with the new screenings, diagnostics, treatments, um, I should have actually highlighted Verda, uh, but Verda Health is actually using technology to reverse type 2 diabetes so they can get you off medications in 70 days. Now, that's pretty interesting. And by the way, they don't want you on medication. They don't want to be invasive. We're now using technology to actually just to, to save us from ingesting all these medications that often don't work. Um, but you know, there's Garden Health, Grail, um, some of these other companies are using DNA to, for cancer detection. Um, and then some other services uh, to stay healthy. There's a lot of companies that are coming up emerging to help you focus on nutrition. Uh, and then you've got wearables. And then one of the areas that I really like, insurance. So there are four constituents in reducing our health care. You are one. I'm one. We have to do a better job taking care of our health care. If we don't, if we don't change our behavior, it doesn't matter what these new technologies do. We have to change. There are three other constituents, payers, physicians, and pharmacies. And guess what? There's $3.5 trillion spent in health care, and all of those guys, they get a part of it. So they're not incentivized to do anything really well to lower the cost because they're making money. So that's why I like insurance companies, these new insurance companies, because they are changing the incentives. They are saying, guess what? These are all wrong. Health IQ, probably going to be the first company that comes out with merit-based health insurance. If you go to the gym, get a dollar off your premium. I mean, that's the type, that's the way insurance should work. Um, and so it's changing. Um, so how much time do I have now? Oh, two minutes more. Okay. You might want to take a couple of questions. Oh, okay. So I can stop there. I was going to get into real estate, but this is the area that I really like. So I can stop there. If anyone has questions, then um, and do that. I'm sorry. Go to real estate. Okay. Well. <laughs> Oh, okay. About. Okay. This is really about yeah. Learning about pre IPOs, what to look for. There are a lot of opportunities out there, and I've been asked by many of my investors to show us how do we get involved. Well, this is a platform where you can get involved, not what I want to discuss, but what I want to show you. She is an expert in this area, and I trust her because she did a deal, and it's all an old. It's all within the club. She's a fantastic analyst, and she has a great platform. But I want to, to focus really on the... get you to see what is happening in this particular area and what's emerging in the healthcare market and possibly also real estate. And you can ask her questions at another time. This is an editorial presentation. So go ahead on real estate if you want to go real quick. Can you get to Oh, okay. Okay, yep, trends in real estate, also pretty significant portion of GDP. Millennials are the biggest buyers of, uh, of homes today. Uh, there's a number of new financing options that are enabling all of this. Lending Club, um, SoFi, which you can call up and immediately they can uh, give you a loan. A lot of this also has to do with recent regulation, specifically the Crowdfunding Jobs Act. Um, home flipping hit a 10-year high. Um, the sharing mindset, that is just something that the, the millennials are really used to. If you notice, I'm actually, I like to focus on the millennials because I think that they drive a lot of demand. Um, so homes are larger, so that means people are actually decorating more of their homes. It's also cheaper to decorate their homes. Uh, and that's why home improvement is also on the rise. That record 316 billion in 2017. So a lot happening in remodeling, renovation, and redesign. Um, 
So and there's another interesting, I, I, I can't really get into it too much, but it, it is an interesting idea. There's a migration out of urban areas. So you're seeing urbanization outside of the big urban areas. So opportunity for growth and remodeling again in these other areas outside of the urban areas as they sort of become, um, as they um, modernize. So some of the startups I like, Finding a Home, Zillow, uh, they already went public. Redfin, they went public. But Zillow is, is, uh, has a much better business model, I believe. Um, and it's also uh, done a lot better. It's, um, it's actually the market cap's a lot larger, but they also have a much larger uh, user base. Um, they're also getting into different parts of real estate. Um, finding real estate investment opportunities. So if you actually want to actually be uh, find commercial properties, you could go to Rooftop, you could go to Crowd Street. They have a number of investments there for you. It's like a marketplace. Um, financing and insurance, all of these new opportunities, particularly with a company like Open Door, which will actually buy your home. They will give you um, they will say to you, um, you know, do you want to wait 60 days and sell your home? Or here's, here's, we'll pay you market prices. The, the trick is that they'll take 10%. But at least you don't have to wait around for your home to sell. So that's becoming popular. That's also probably valued at about $2 billion right now. Renting or leasing, obviously everybody knows Airbnb, but you have apartment list as well, which is all about rentals. Um, it's all about uh, just, just rentals, not for not for you know, uh, vacation, uh, short-term stays. Then furnishing and remodeling, I don't know how many use house um, or hover to. Hover to is all about capturing your house in 3D and figuring out how to remodel. Um, it was great, we just recently uh, moved and I actually got to remodel my home. I'm not an architect, but I was able to remodel my home and decide what size furniture I could put in and it was like doing a little, um, like a, a little dollhouse uh, on my computer. So, uh, and there's all these new technologies that are emerging, probably features, but uh, new technologies nonetheless. Uh, servicing and securing home, like Thumbtack I mentioned to you. Uh, Nest, which was purchased by Google. Ring, purchased by Amazon. Uh, Nest, they're all over our house. I don't know how many people use Nest, but it's great to be able to turn up the heat when we go up to Lake Tahoe. I'm from California, so uh, it's really nice to know who's putting up the heat really high and who's being reasonable. And Ring is the one that Amazon bought for a billion dollars. Um, and then a number of place, uh, companies that are emerging. WeWork will probably go public. That's probably one you're going to be most familiar with. And HQO, which is a new company. So if you, and this is my last point. So WeWork is, how many people know WeWork? Okay, so they're recreating what it means to work in a co-working uh, co space. It has uh, you know, classes, it has a gym, it has all these amenities. Again, it looks like a hotel. And HKO, that's a new company that's emerging. What they're doing is they're trying to work with all of these landlords who are saying, hey, this WeWork company is like, you know, buying up all our real estate and they're much, much better landlords. We need help. So they're going in and they're working with existing landlords and saying, hey, we will amenitize your building for you and we'll provide the software. So that's what's happening in real estate. Fantastic. And Bambi, yeah. what I'd like to share with the audience is, how many deals do you, you probably look at thousands and you pick very few, and how long does it take you to do your due diligence to really put them up there? Um, so <laughs> I think you saw that we probably, on average, on average we see about 200 companies a month. Um, and so we probably look in, uh, on a year, probably 1%, and probably about, it, probably about nine months. Right. to look at a company. And how many fail? On average, of the 200 you're seeing, how many fail? Lots. Well, I mean, I think everybody know not everybody, you don't know the statistics. They're significant. So, um, it, it's, I don't, I, you know, I, so many fail, I forgot the number. It's either 75% to 90%. It's, it's a huge number, a very small number actually go public, un, maybe under 10%. I know of those that survive, 75% do get acquired. Uh, but the IPO number, as you said, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But lots of failures. But you sure. have to know what you're doing, and she does. So that's the most important point here. I hope. Thank you, <laughs> Thank Bambi. You. Thank you very, very much.